recent study found that 67% of Europeans believe that women lack abilities to become high-level scientists. Now, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a wife, I'm a scientist. I'm a leader amongst scientists, I'm an academic leader, I'm the dean of the Faculty of Science at Ryerson University, one of the most exciting universities in Canada. So I deny these numbers, I defy these numbers, I challenge these numbers, and I'm committed to changing these numbers. That's not to say that science is a friendly place for, for women. That's very interesting, some of you laughed. Science is not a friendly place for women. The gender stereotypes around what women can and can't do, what they should and shouldn't do, what scientists may look like, and what they need to succeed, can be very incompatible. So science can be a lonely place, and this has led to science having a diversity problem. And here's a report from the Institute of Physics which describes that diversity problem. Physics is overwhelmingly white, male, and middle class. It's not just a gender issue, it's a socioeconomic issue. It's an ethnic background issue. And the fact that there's a, science, a diversity issue in science means that we're missing out on contributions from people who can bring different motivations and experiences, who can have different perspectives and different kinds of skill sets. If physics is going to answer some of the great questions of the universe, and if physics is going to help us address some of the biggest problems that the human race faces, then we need everybody to be active in physics. We need everybody working in the field. We need to bring everybody to the table. If the world was a village of 100 people, 52 of those people would be women. So it's not unreasonable to expect that we might see human endeavors and disciplines have that kind of reflection in terms of, of the proportion of people, proportion of genders, the proportion of members of different communities involved in those activities. And indeed, you might be a little surprised to know that when we look at numbers of young men and young women enrolled in science courses, science, technology, engineering, and math, often put together as uh, STEM, we can see that through middle school and high school, in many parts of the world, Canada included, we see roughly equivalent or equal proportions of men and women, young men, young women, enrolled in these programs. Now these numbers, roughly equivalent, don't tell us anything about the experience of those young men or young women in these particular courses. And study after study has shown that actually the experience of these young men and young women in these courses is very different. And it's, it begins to separate in terms of their experience as they go on through the system. And in fact, by the time girls are in high school and taking sciences, they are becoming filled with self-doubt and losing self-confidence, and they're seriously underestimating their abilities, while studies have shown that boys typically overestimate their abilities. This leads to a decrease, or correlates with a decrease further, in the enrollment of young women and young men uh, proportionally in university level courses. So Canadian data shows that in the STEM disciplines, and again, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, we see a roughly two thirds to one third split in terms of the proportion of men and women taking these courses. And if we continue the trajectory out to what is considered by many the ultimate prize in science, the Nobel Prize, we can see that a mere 3% of these prizes are awarded to women. 3% of those ultimate prizes in science, uh, medicine, physiology, physics, are going to women. These numbers are appalling. And these numbers have led to concepts like the leaky pipeline, where we're losing young women from the system. They're actually being pushed out. They're leaving. They're tired, they're isolated, they're exhausted. It's not just a leaky pipeline, the plumbing itself is broken. And it doesn't matter if you're a married woman, if you're single, if you've got children. It actually doesn't matter if you're a Hispanic student 
or a First Nation student, your numbers are going to drop as you go through the career pathway in science. And so we have headlines that say, plug the leaky pipeline or redesign the pipeline. We're losing brilliance. We're losing genius. We're losing potential. We're losing possible contributions. We're losing the voices. So why does this happen? Well, from the moment we're born, male or female, we're immersed in cultural conditioning. Doesn't matter what part of the world you come from, one of these babies is a girl. And as soon as she's wrapped in a pink blanket, either metaphorically or literally, her frame of reference has been defined. Her future will be framed by the gender expectations of her community and by the stereotypes within the cultural context in which she's raised. In the English-speaking world, we have gendered toys. We have coloring books for girls and coloring books for boys. Why don't we have coloring books for kids? The coloring books for girls are pink, and they have hearts and birds. The coloring books for boys have robots and pirate ships and Vikings and plant thingies with big, sharp teeth that are really cool, <laughs> and I would have loved to color in. We have toys for boys because they like kooky things. They like to build kooky things. They make them. We have, girl, we have toys for girls because they love pretty things. It's very passive. They're not actually doing anything. They're very passively just loving toy. We have girls' toys and boys' toys separated in different parts of toy stores. We have girls' toys, which are the dolls. We have boys' toys, which are the building sets. Why do we entertain this? Because boys don't cuddle and girls don't build. There's an organization in the UK called Let Toys Be Toys. It's been quite effective at actually getting various um, marketing agencies and ver various toy stores to actually change some of this kind of uh, gender stereotyping and labeling. And kids know that it's not fair. At the age of seven or eight, growing up in the UK, going to a co-ed primary school, in the uh, early 70s, the girls in my class would be separated into one class and the boys into another, and the girls would be taken off to go and do sewing lessons. The boys would go off and do woodworking. And I knew at that age that that wasn't fair. That's just not fair. I wanted to have a go at whatever those boys were doing. Maybe I wasn't any good at it. Doesn't matter. I wanted to have the opportunity. And from that point, or from a very early age, I became very aware of gender st stereotyping and barriers against um, accessibility um, and the potential to be excluded from things that I wanted to do or I was good at. And even as a very well-intentioned, highly educated, highly aware parent, I found it very difficult, have found it very difficult to challenge the intense and immersive and overwhelming cultural conditioning that we are all experienced. When my daughter was about six, she went to a birthday party. And as is the tradition, at the end of the birthday party, the children have the opportunity to take a gift home, a thank you gift from the birthday girl. And in this case, there were two gifts available. And my daughter, we collected everything up, and I brought my daughter to where the gifts were. And the, the mother of the birthday girl said, pick a, pick a gift. And my daughter went to pick a puzzle. And the mother of the birthday girl said, oh, that's the one you want? The toy for the boys? And at that moment in time, I was dumbstruck. I didn't know what to say. And I was probably the most aware person within about 100 miles of that birthday party in terms of gender stereotyping and uh, exclusion to girls in terms of uh, access to things like technology. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to disrupt the social dynamic. I didn't want to upset the mother of this birthday girl. I didn't want to offend. And I said nothing. And I honestly cannot remember whether my daughter put down that toy and picked up the makeup kit or whether she held the toy. In my head, my story is she held the toy and paused and said, yes, that's the one I'd like. That's the story I've told myself. I hope it's true. Kids know it's not fair. Kids are smart. They want opportunities. They want to try things. Every child is born a natural scientist. Here's the only guide you need to determine whether a toy is for boys or girls. Do you operate the toy with your genitalia? 
If the answer is yes, it's not a toy for children. If the answer is no, it's a toy for girls or boys. Okay? <laughs> Take that message home with you and apply it in your everyday life, in the holiday season, at Halloween with costumes, every opportunity. Do not deny girls or boys their full potential. Not just children. We have absurd marketing that thinks that women need special kinds of ballpoint pens. Rightfully, BIC were much ridiculed for this, rightfully. But it's very perv pervasive and subversive. Samsung, in a recent commercial, depict women as being very naive and almost incompetent around computers. Whereas the men may use the computers for their business, women will use those laptops for videos of their kids or for using Facebook. And indeed, when this woman in this commercial was given a screwdriver, she looks at it, as they say, like it's an alien probe. She doesn't know what to do with it. Media and marketing, popular television and movies further restrict the imagery around what women can achieve in terms of STEM. Only 14% of the characters in films depicted in STEM careers are shown as women. That's even lower than what's actually existing out there in the real world. It's about 17%, it's not great, but this is lower. So popular media uh, has played a hugely detrimental um, place in determining what gender stereotypes around women in STEM look like. And this is why companies like Google Microsoft and some of the big tech companies in Silicon Valley are now working with the creative arts industry in Hollywood to actually shift that imagery, show a better representation of women in STEM, in television, and in movies. And if you think about the huge influx of TV shows about medical doctors and lawyers that happened in the 70s and 80s, think about what kind of influence those kinds of changes can have. So remember that we're immersed in cultural conditioning. We're all subject to implicit bias, and it's all of these little things that add up over time, from the moment that baby is wrapped in a pink blanket to the time she's tired at the end of high school and trying to decide what to do with her life. And can she make it? Can she hack it? Can she actually achieve her goal? It's not one big thing. It's a thousand little things. It's just an ad. It's just a toy. It's just a phrase. I was just joking. It's just the internet. It's just a TV show. It's death by a thousand cuts. It's a chilly climate. It's the imposter syndrome. You've been told for so long you don't belong, you don't fit in, you don't look like a scientist, you don't look like an engineer. You begin to doubt yourself. When I first started graduate school, I definitely experienced imposter syndrome. They were going to find out that I really shouldn't be there. When I got my first faculty position as an assistant professor, I had the same sensation. I really didn't deserve to be there. They were going to find me out I was an imposter. It's very, very real. And it's a consequence of all of these little things that add up over time. These little things are barriers, they, they, they are exclusionary, and they lead to inequity. So we need to change the numbers. And this is actually a, this is an initiative put forward by L'Oreal Foundation who are very active in changing the numbers in terms of the numbers of women and girls involved in STEM. And let's be clear, this isn't a new thing. Women have been doing science since forever. Women are good at science. Women have been teaching geometry classes with the same expressions on the faces of the students that we see in geometry classes today. Thrilled, excited, engaged. <laughs> Going back even further, we have famous Greek astronomers, mathematicians. And yes, she was severely abused and killed for following her profession. And one of my favorite scientists, we just celebrated the anniversary of her birth last week, 101. I wish she was here. Hedy Lamarr aspired and achieved the ultimate of what a woman should be and look like in her era. She was known, named, as the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. She's also a rocket scientist. You can be smoking hot and you can be a rocket scientist. 
You don't have to deny your femininity. You can be good looking. You can be fat. You can be old. You can be young. It doesn't matter. You can be a scientist. Hedy Lamar was a rocket scientist, and she and her colleagues developed patents that provided the foundation for the wireless technology that you're all holding in your hands right now, tweeting. So if you have a smartphone and you rely on wireless technology for anything, you can thank Hedy Lamar and her colleagues. Women have been doing science since forever. We know lots of famous women. We know a few famous women. We don't know enough of them. There are some well-known names, but importantly, I want people to realize that women doing science is normal. There are thousands of amazing graduate students and undergraduate summer students, postdocs, research scientists in government labs, research scientists in pharmaceutical labs, technicians, programmers, engineers. NASA has done an amazing job of incorporating women into its teams. Women doing science is normal, it's not exceptional, and it should be encouraged. So let's break down those barriers. Let's blow those stereotypes out of the water and let's get rid, at least identify, and get rid of our implicit bias. And why is this important? Because if we don't have equity and inclusivity and provide access and embrace diversity and include everybody at the table, then we might miss something. We might miss the mind that has the solution. If the cure for cancer is in the mind of a girl, we might never find it. Just think about that for a minute. Diversity means seeing yourself reflected. It means having the opportunity to pursue careers broader than the stereotypes that are presented to you in your community. These young women could see that a scientist could look just like them, that there was more than Rihanna and Beyonce and Destiny's Child in their future, that a scientist could look just like them. Diversity means seeing yourself reflected and being included and being provided with access and being allowed to achieve your full potential. Diversity has been shown to increase creativity and innovation. It's good for the bottom line. It's better for businesses. It's better for communities. It creates innovation. It's better for students. It improves the quality of learning and the quality of teaching for students. And to quote Shirley Ann Jackson, do not let yourself be defined by what others think you should be. Define yourself. Do not be limited by what others expect for you, but reach confidently for the stars. It's such a simple, simple thing. Last word to Malala. We cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. So we're going to change the numbers. Thank you.